wanted to be the very best vessel that he could be to bring honor and glory to the Lord's name. He didn't want to bring dishonor to his name. He didn't want to be disapproved. He didn't want to be found unfit for service. And so his desire here in writing to Timothy is be fit for serve. Be a vessel that brings honor to the Lord. And we looked, and I won't go into great deal, great depths, but here, focus on the foundation in verse 19. Remember that as Christians, we cannot stop being Christians. If you're a Christian, you're a Christian for all eternity. In other words, it's not based on what you do, it's based on what God does. And the Holy Spirit who lives within you confirms that indeed you belong. You have God's seal of approval um, that it, you belong to him. And no man can take you out of God's hands. Once you're there, you're there for eternity. And I find it interesting that there are people saying, I used to be a Christian, but I saw the light. Well, you didn't see the light because you'd still be in the light. Um, there are so many people that think that base their salvation upon what they do and what they don't do, that determines whether a Christian. It's by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ and he takes that faith and he places you and adopts you and me into his family. And once we're there, he's the only one that can take you out of his family and he doesn't do that. You belong to him for all eternity. So we've got this um, security as a Christian. And he goes on to talk about the functions that you would find, and that's one of the verses, but a feasible function. And he talks about the different vessels that you're likely to find in a wealthy home. See, in a home, we've got all sorts of utensils and instruments that we use. Some, um, you know, if I was inviting a person into my house, where would I take you? What would I show off the most? It would be the lounge room, the living room, or somewhere where you'd be comfortable, where I've got my pictures or something else. I wouldn't say, hey, look, you want to see the bathroom? It's not the most honourable place. But, you know, the bathroom has a function, doesn't it? All the utensils there have a function, but they're not the ones that you put on display. Although some people do, they put them on display. But what I'm saying is we all have a function, some more than others. But we need a favourable feature, and that favourable feature here for a Christian is that we need to have a lifestyle that reflects who we follow. If we say we follow the Lord Jesus, then it must be reflected in the lives that we live. And that means a daily cleansing. As these bin shows, we pick up and are contaminated by the world. We need to be clean so that we're bright and we're a vessel that brings honour to the Lord. So we've got these features that we must pursue. And I think we did this last week. I'm not sure. I think we did... Uh, no, that's gone too far. A fervent faith. And here we started on this, I think, um, in that we need to keep away from youthful fashions. And I was going to break this down a little bit. Um, from those youthful... Flee from youthful fa um, passions. It's our old way of life. We're to stay away from it and we're to follow after righteousness. So what Paul is saying is we need to be wise and wise ourselves up as Christians. We don't have to go back to our youthful passions to express ourselves, particularly when, as a Christian, I have the fruit of the Spirit living within me. And if the fruit of the Spirit is living within me, then it means I allow God to control my life. And as I do that, the fruit of the Spirit expresses himself in my actions, my thoughts, and my attitudes. And it means that if I am to honour the Lord and be a vessel and fit for service, then I must pursue or give diligence to, and the original word means to press hard with the desire to obtain righteousness. In other words, pursue those things which are good. Don't waste your time on things which are bad, but pursue those things which are good. 
such things as truthfulness, fairness and justice. In other words, doing what's right according to God's standards. We're to pursue faith. And that means a consistent and constant trust in God rather than ourselves. And that's where faith and living it out becomes a bit of a struggle sometimes because we like to live by what we can see. And faith is saying, well, what does God have to say about this? And then putting it into practice and living it when everything else is saying is the opposite. And so it's living by faith. It means to have a firm conviction. It means that we're settled in the truth. In other words, to know what you believe and why you believe it. It's not because somebody else told you. This is the settled conclusion and conviction that you came to yourself. This is what I believe and this is why I believe it. And that's why we can share it with others. We're to pursue faithfulness as a way of life. And that means we're to be trustworthy. We're reliable. We're dependable. If we're given a job, we counted, can be counted on to finish it, not just quit and give up. In other words, we believe, and it comes down to our concept of who God is. Is God all he says he is? Is he mighty? Is he all-powerful? Is he enough for me? Will he keep his word? Can I trust him? And to pursue love means acting in the best interests of other people. And so there's a lot. And it talks about peace, living in harmony and unity with other Christians. And what it's saying is we are to pursue these things with a passion. Give diligence to. That should be our way of life. He then goes on in verse 23. A foolish fixation, but reject foolish and ignorant controversies because you know they breed in fighting. What is Paul saying? He's making a plain, don't get involved in useless debates. Don't have anything to do with silly controversies that have nothing... He's saying, don't have anything to do with them. They won't do you any good. Now, it's very easy to get caught up in controversies, conspiracies, all sorts of things that the world has, and what good will it do? It actually divides a lot of people in what they think. Now, I found an interesting word in the original, the word foolish. Does anyone know what the Greek word for that is? We get our English word moron from it. Foolish, moron, stupid and ignorant, untrained, undisciplined, uninstructed. So it's pretty powerful, you know. I'm not saying you go around and call people morons, but that's the idea of foolishness. It's moronic. He used another word for speculation, zetesis, means to question, to debate, to argue, to dispute, everything that's not what we're about disputing questioning arguing everything and what paul is saying is what's the point in untrained uninstructed undisciplined men spouting useless arguments against the truth and he's saying why do you get yourself involved in a conversation with them it's not going to amount to any good they're not listening and you won't win any arguments with them they take away from scripture Now, one commentator says the same thing about the Greek word means moronic. In other words, sometimes people will say things just to see if they can get you riled up. In other words, they know how to push your buttons. Have we got buttons that can be pushed? That You push the right button, you get the, uh, the response that they're looking for. And there are some people that are just good at getting under the skin and pushing that button. And no matter, you know what they're doing, you know what's happening, but you still can't help yourself. They push that button and it's, everything happens because they push the right button. Paul's advice is simple, but it's not always easy to follow. Don't let them do it. Don't let them get you riled up. Don't lose your cool. Don't blow your top. Don't allow them to say things you shouldn't and don't end up in a bit of shouting match 
That's what happens when people pushes our buttons. We're not permitted to yell back at those who yell at us. We're not to curse those who curse us. We're not to intimidate those who try to intimidate us. In short, we're not to use the same tactics or the strategies of those who oppose us and ridicule our faith. We're to keep our cool, if you like, at all times. Now why? Why should we do this? But one person says, it's very practical. You can't argue a person into the kingdom of God. But you can insult them and you can offend them. You, can, you can't intimidate them into accepting Christ as Saviour with all your facts, with all your figures. It won't work. It's quite possible that when we produce the same tactics as those employed by our opposition, that we can argue people away from becoming a Christian. And the reason is because salvation is a miracle from God that transforms and changes the heart. Only God can do that. You and I can't. Only the Holy Spirit can convert a person's soul. It's not our arguments that win the loss. Because unless the Holy Spirit works on the heart, all our words will amount to nothing. Therefore, we must be gentle under pressure and we must be kind even when we're pushed to the limit. As I said this morning in my message, I don't want to, God wants us to be people who just tell the truth. Speak the truth. We don't have to be eloquent, we don't have to be skilled, but we just have to be willing and obedient and tell people the truth. He takes that word and he uses it. But we have to open our mouths for that truth to come out so that people can um, be used. He says, a faithful focus. And the Lord's slave must not engage in heated disputes but be kind toward all and an apt teacher, patient. Wow. To be fit for service, to achieve honour for the Lord can only be done by surrendering all rights and privileges to the Lord. If we want to accomplish and be under God's control, we must surrender our rights and our privileges for him to use us. Because you know what? That's what a slave does. A slave has no rights and privileges except given to him by his master. We say we're slaves of Jesus Christ. We're not here to live our own lives, but live in a way that pleases him. So we surrender those rights and those privileges to him. And Paul uses a word here which means to get involved in heated disputes and fights, even into serious conflicts that leads to bitter and intensive exchanges between individuals. You know, I always marvel when you see two people having a conversation, it's just a normal conversation, and then you see it get heated. And what happens when it goes to the next level? They start throwing punches. It becomes very, very heated in the expression of views. And so what Paul is saying is don't allow yourself to get to that point in your life. Don't get involved. Someone has said, remember that an argument is the longest distance between two points of view. Let me repeat that. An argument is the longest distance between two points of view. Now, the word he uses in the Greek is used to describe a wind of such high intensity that it levels everything in its path. Now, we know what that means up here. If a cyclone comes, it's destructive. And there's not much you can do, but it levels everything in its path. And when we allow and get ourselves involved in heated controversies and conflicts, it can become like a cyclone. We lose control and it wipes out everything and destroys everything in front of it. The servant of the Lord must not gauge in word of war or blow away those who block his path in one way or another. So we're not here to win arguments. We're not out to squash the opposition or silence those who are 
disagreeing with us through heavy-handed approaches. That's not the way that we're to operate. Rather, the servant of God is to encourage discussion and examination. He doesn't put down people or resort to name-calling. He's not argumentative. He's not contentious. He's someone, if you like, who is peaceful, who's kind, who's laid back, and has that sort of... They're rare people to find. And I've come across a couple of people. Nothing seems to get them angry. They're that laid back. Sometimes I wonder if they're really with us in life. But there are some people that nothing gets them upset. They're able to take things as they come. They're very laid back. And they don't allow circumstances to trigger buttons that get them riled up. They're people who think before they speak and act with understanding because they think about the consequences of the people that they're involving in their conversation. A servant of God doesn't pour more fuel on a raging fire. It doesn't mean he gives in to popular opinion to those who oppose him. He exercises meekness, strength under control. He seeks to produce truth in a way that people can see it for what it is and this is why Paul said this person is apt to teach and what I like about that to be able and apt or have the ability to teach what does that actually mean sometimes we think that to do that you have to be the sharpest pencil in the pack you don't the implication here is not how, mu how good a person is at collecting data or how good a person is at organising that data, but how good he is in commuting that, communicating that, da that data. It has to do with the skill with which he communicates or gets his message across to people. He's one who's able to teach, skillfully dealing with the facts involved. He's not allowing his feelings. He's not allowing fantasies to um, oppose him, but he's expressing the facts of Scripture. And it's very easy for us, when we get involved in an argument, to become sidetracked, to slide away from the facts, and we allow our feelings, we allow our experiences and our reaction to things to take over. What Paul is saying is, no, concentrate on the facts. Just present the truth. What is there? What does it say? And allow God to do his work. Then he talks about, oops, you would think we finished. But no, these verses, he says, correcting opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance and their knowledge of the truth. And they will come to their senses and escape the devil's trap where they are held captive to do his will. In other words, if we're vessels, if we're instruments that are fit for service, we don't use or engage in the same tactics as our opponents, those who seek to ridicule our faith. Now, that doesn't mean we are to be doormats and allow people to walk all over us. That's not what it's saying. It means that there are some issues that we are called to make a stand for the purpose of change in the person who is opposing. Paul says our task as vessels fit for service is to correct those who stand in opposition to us with the message that we bring. In other words, it's not about us knocking that person into shape. It's presenting the message that will knock that person into shape, that will correct an attitude, that will transform a behaviour. And we do this by exercising meekness and gentleness in our approach. In other words, that meekness is power under control. Praying that the way we present truth will be an opportunity to correct the opinions that are opposed to allowing change to take place by presenting alternative approaches to the issue that were not considered. You know, when you engage people, it's amazing how... There are some people that are so fixed on what they want to express 
that they haven't considered any other side and it's amazing when you just very gently and say have you thought about this particular view and of course if you've done it in the right way it stops and pulls them up because they haven't given thought or appreciate there are other perspectives apart from the one that they're presenting and that gives us an opportunity to be able to call for a change uh, in their attitude it's being able to speak to people in love when they're opposed to us when they're resistant people cannot help themselves and always seek to oppose something whether it's good or not if they don't like the uh, idea they'll oppose it because they can and you know in life you run into people who don't want to listen to what you have to say they have their own opinions already formulated and they let you know you're not welcome we don't want to listen to what you have to say we've already made up our minds about this but then they will listen to you you know they're opposed to anything you say but when you do say something um, it's amazing how later on when they've thought about it they do change and we're going to find that in the world in which we live the world in which we live there are people with different worldviews they're coming from different perspectives and we're going to encounter those they're not going to be a biblical be biblical based and we're going to have to deal with them and it's how we deal with them reflects whether we're vessels of honor or not the thing we all know but easily forget is the only person we can change in a controversy is ourselves we cannot change other people you can force their behavior to be different but you can't change them from the inside out only God can do that so it talks about the Greek here repentance a change of mind a change of attitude and a change of will towards God and sin it's not about regret which is something that says oh I'm sorry I got caught it's a complete lifestyle change um, and repentance is always involved in it and truth is what will change a person and when we present the Word of God the Word of God is something that can stand on its own <laughs> God can take any any word any of his word to touch people's hearts with he just needs people to communicate it you know have you heard what the Bible said about this let me read it to you and then you don't have to argue you just say well look this is what God says think about it will you and that way you've given them some food for thought and you've given God an opportunity to be able to address the heart issue and that's what the word does but he also says they will come to their senses and escape the devil's trap when they're held captive to his will Wow this truth this knowledge will bring them to their senses and help them to awaken out of their spiritual and drunken stupor now it's interesting that's what the original Greek word means to be in a drunken spiritual stupor they don't know it they can't see it Satan lies and deceives people he intoxicates them with the pleasures of the flesh the material possessions of the world and the power and position they have and God's people are to sober them up to rescue them with the truth of God's Word now Paul makes it plain the devil is responsible for snaring or taking people captive and he does so by numbing their conscience by confusing their minds by paralyzing their will so they can no longer resist or break free from his enticements that's his job and as God's people we need to be aware of those tactics because he's very very accomplished in using those tactics to numb my conscience to say hey it's all right everybody's doing it it's fine and God will forgive you confusing their minds playing mind games and then paralyzing their will so that they can no longer resist the temptation now in ancient times people believed that gods and demons had set traps and nets to snare them and make them their slaves that's what they thought in the ancient world and make no mistake the devil is an active agent in snaring and destroying people Paul's point is simple if you're not fit to serve God 
And you can't be fit to serve God if you're being held captive by the devil. The original makes it plain. Held captive means to catch alive, to make a prisoner of war. And this is the position that people find themselves in who are held by the devil. They are his spiritual captives. This captivating influence and power over individuals comes from an external source outside the person who is being held captive. And it's speaking about the tactics and strategies that the devil employs and the power he has over people to exert his will over them. These individuals are captured alive at some point in time in their past and they're still ensnared, held as a prisoner of spiritual warfare by the deceiver himself. And let me just say, there are so many Christians that are held captive to their past. They can't break away from their past. It doesn't matter what the scriptures say, the truth shall set you free and you will be free indeed. No matter what God says, they seem to believe themselves captive to their past, that they cannot escape it, that it always pulls them back. God says that's not true. I paid the price for your sins, past, present and future at Calvary so that you can be free and you can be free indeed to live the abundant life. In other words, deal with your past, put it to the cross of Calvary. It's not any more problem to you unless you allow it to be. And as Christians, we need to understand. This is the tactic of the devil saying, hey, God didn't forgive you your past. You still got to pay for what you've done. Well, Christ paid the penalty for what I've done. Do I believe God or do I believe Satan? And so many Christians believe their little voices to say, you're not good enough as a Christian. You've done this, you've done that. You've got to pay for this, you know. And we ra- we're held captive to him because that's how he appeals. We must be alert to the fact that when we contend for the truth, we're going to involve ourselves in spiritual warfare. (laughs) You know, we're taking on the devil who's a past master. We're entering his territory and we better be prepared. And we mustn't be naive to think that we confront such opposition on our human terms. I can't fight fight the devil on my own strength. He'll overpower me. But as a servant, as a vessel that the Lord uses, we must maintain a healthy balance and not become preoccupied with the devil's role to the point that we lose sight that our God is in control and more powerful. Sometimes we give Satan too much credence and power than he has. Our God is more powerful. He's more in control of situations and people than the devil is and yet we think oh the devil is up there with God he is not he is a created being from God and he understands this and his day of reckoning is coming but we're to have a balance yes we know the devil is the prince of the power of the air of this world and yes he does have control in some things but our God is over him and his power is greater because he lives within us we can overcome the strategies, but we must be alert. We're involved in spiritual warfare and be aware of it when it happens to us. Remember, this is not a power struggle. It's a struggle about truth. This verse is not telling us or instructing us to go off on witch hunts, to seek out demons behind every spiritual problem we encounter. He's there, but we don't have to look for him. He's there, but we don't have to give him the credit for everything that is happening. What Paul says, seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. And when we do that, we'll be given that discernment, that understanding, and we'll be given that empowerment to live the life in his power that we need. So we're to be prepared for ourselves for every good work. The challenge is, what sort of service do we want to offer the Lord? He wants to use us. What sort of vessel are you and I 
going to become. Vessels that honour him, vessels that are fit for service, or vessels that are wasteful and useless in his service. And that's the challenge of this passage. Are we fit to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? And I hope to say, yes, we are. It's not meaning we're perfect, but hey, we are his instruments. And if we allow ourselves and submit our wills to his, he can use us. And so it's a matter of saying, I will, I want to be used, rather than I don't want to. Let's be useful by saying, I will, and I will do. As we close, we're going to just look at... Um, if I